Daddy had been involved in the school newspaper, and he never looked back. Right here. What a great now, tonight's feature presentation, what uh, Mark didn't mention to you about Greg Smith is that he's also known as Mr. President. He's the president of Papa, the Port Francis Preservation Historical Association. He runs the show. And we couldn't have found a better president, though it took some threatening to get him to accept. He has for you today a slogan that I expect you'll never forget. Thank you. The passes in this area were almost shifting. And until we caught the passes, we couldn't settle the area. The story of one such pass and one such struggle is not in the museum. It took us five tries for 50 years to catch that shifting pass. All the passes have been shifting. And Greg is going to make sense out of that for you. Greg? But 
we recognize the need of water transport on there. And one of the problems with Corpus Christi was it was hard to get to. This is how you came in through the Aransas Pass, not the city of Aransas Pass, but the pass. You had to go around, head towards Rockport, turn there, Corpus Christi Bayou, and this was only a few feet deep, winding, difficult with a, a, a sailboat. You really needed a steamer. Come in there and go into Corpus Christi. That was a full day's travel right there. So Henry Kinney was the first one, first man to try to start making changes. He bought a dredge boat. Uh, it was a wooden dredge. We don't know if it was steam powered or whether well, it was steam on there. He didn't quite pay his bills. They started digging out, made a little uh, effort to do some digging here with it. He ran out of money. The dredge ran out of the wood, so couldn't fire the boilers. It ended up being abandoned right about there. In the Civil War, that the uh, Confederate forces used the dredge as kind of a quasi-fort because the Yankees came in up through here wanted to get in there with it. And then after they were overpowered, the uh, here in, in post ranches where the, the Yankees were, they would go and make four way, forays and chop up the dredge for the firewood, which was in uh, much demand. So this was the first in the 1840s, late 1840s, was the first effort to dig in the area. Then along came a line of ropes. Henry Kitty called himself a colonel. He did actually make it up to captain at one point in time. A line of ropes enlisted in the Union Army. He was uh, from New York. He, he got up to be a sergeant. Then after the war, that, uh, he attached himself, or got to the unit that was the uh, Buffalo Soldiers stationed down in Brownsville on there, and he became a, a captain at that point in time. So he promoted himself later on to a colonel. He went, he went back up north, but uh, he was a bit of a promoter and an entrepreneur himself. And he, he came back down for health reasons on here. He thought the area had great opportunity, so he started promoting the area. And his vision was large. He thought large. He tied up this at Flower Bluff, what's now the south side of Corpus Christi, the cliffs on there. But the keystone of his project, he recognized that they needed navigation into Corpus Christi Bay. So in 1890, he bought a dredge boat, he, uh, the Josephine on there, and he started, he created port ropes, he was going to bring in a railroad going in there, and cut, cut that channel with it. This is the site. If you go down, I, it's just before you get to the Mayan princess on there, this is where the actual channel was cut. It was only 30 feet wide, about 10 feet deep. The engineers at the time said it'll never work. They're just putting a toy jetty. He built the jetties 200 feet long out of basic, uh, basically sacks of stone with it. And guess what? The engineers were right. When you make a jetty that's 30 feet wide and 10 feet deep, it does, or not a jetty, but a, a channel, it, it doesn't have the power to study. And he ran out of money, too. And at that point in time, a cousin of my great-grandfather's, one of his investors in there, and this was in 1893, and, and Matt Dunn was really not happy with his investment in the rope project and ran his clip, and he ran into a couple of ropes on the street and uh, just kind of informed him of his dissatisfaction and used his into this cane to uh, reinforce his uh, issues with it. Well, after that meeting, that uh, Colonel Roach decided that uh, his, the climate up north was a little bit better, even though he did file charges against Matt Dunn. The fact that the Dunns were about 2% of the voting population, and uh, Colonel Roach skinned half the town, but uh, never went to Trump. That, that was the end, and, and uh, Colonel Ropes went back and died young, 1898, in New York. A, a broken man, his great 
occasions, and it was called the Ropes Boom in, in Corpus Christi at the time, with it. He, he changed the landscape and ended up with nothing. This is a closer up picture of where the channel was. You see right there, that's a little bit of remnant, actually, of, of that channel with it. Uh, this is where the, the dirt pit is, uh, the state park boundary right there. And there's the Josephine. Like Colonel Kinley's dredge ran out of money, ran out of coal, it just died right where it is. It's still noted, it's buried under the sand dunes. It was a steam dredge, paddle wheel on it. We have one, I was talking to Bubba Molina, Bubba's 95 years old, and he remembers when he was a young child in the 30s going there, and the dredge was still there, sticking out of the sand. But now it's under the sand, if we took a metal detector, we could probably go find it because it is referred to in uh, surveys. Now as we shift down a little bit down the island, if we all go to Corpus Christi and we go over the bridge and we're going 70 miles an hour, we're going to take SPID, we're going to get up on 361, go over what we call the Packery today, Run down 361, 17 mile road with it. But what we don't realize, this was the old Corpus Christi Pass. This was the boundary between Padre Island and Mustang Island. Where the concrete seawall is in Padre Island and all the condos are on Padre Island, these Padre Islanders, what they don't know is they're not on Padre Island at all. That's Mustang Island. <laughs> so so this, this was the old pass. Eight miles long on there, there was a little Civil War skirmish that took place there, uh, right here. But if you wanted to get to Corpus Bay, it was about four feet deep there. But as you got out to this area, the water shoaled up about two or three feet. So in the history of the area, it was never very good for navigation, even though the water depths in this area would be 15 to 20 feet deep. And then again, I was talking before about getting to the bay on there. This was what was called Turtle Cove. And actually, this is Harbor Island. This is Buffalo Bayou, Shell Point. And this was mudflats. So until 1909, uh, it was about a foot above uh, sea level. So only during high water times would you actually have the water going over there. So as we're getting on the ferry and we watch all those ships go by, that used to be dry land it, it, until 1909, until that happened. When, in 1909, the first channel was built. With it. We have Linda Zahn here, whose husband Charlie is the vice chairman of the Port of Corpus Christi, which started in 19. 26, but what a lot of people don't understand, 1909 was when that was originally dredged. And then in 1912, it was eight feet deep. This, this was about the size of it, eight feet deep. 1912, 75 feet wide. 1912, they widened it up to 100 feet wide and 12 feet deep. In 1926, the uh, navigation district was created. It was actually 1923. But then they really made a ship channel out of it and widened it to 200 feet wide and it was 25 feet deep at that time. <clears throat> 1952, they widened it to 400 feet wide and 30 feet deep. By 1989, 48 feet deep and 400 feet wide. Now what's interesting about this is the circulation in our bay system that there was very little water going into the bay system. It would go into San Antonio Bay and come out. So now we have this huge 50 feet wide, 400 feet. And it's really changed, it actually started in 1909. Changed the circulations in our bays. It changed how all of our passes behave with there because now we have a slow water going through where we didn't have before. Now, 
19, in 1909, that's when that was done. 1916, I, I showed you the old CC Corpus Christi Pass before. This is where it went. We had our first of our two disastrous storms was in 1916. And at that time, all of this area, it was a washover area, and the sand washed over, filled in Corpus Christi Pass of this section here, and opened a new gateway, which is right there. That's if you drive over at 70 miles an hour, the little sign that's there that says Corpus Christi Pass. So it moved about three miles further north on it. And a little interesting aside, Mark Young is, uh, uh, runs the water district here. I was talking to the city of Corpus Christi. This area here was taken in 1948. They're going to put in a multi-million dollar pumping station. And I, I was putting this together and got this email about it. This is Newport Pass. This was a washover that was done. This is where they're planning on putting their pumping station. So, uh, you know, that's, that's not the best place to, to put it. This was Corpus Christi Pass. This picture was taken in, in the 1940s. And this is how you move cattle across from Mustang Island to Padre Island. This was the Mustang Island shoreline. You can see the cowboys back there on the horizon. They're just coming up, uh, up the bank on the Padre side with you. And at this pass, there was a fishing village sitting there. And this was during the Depression. It was a place for people to come from Texas, from Oklahoma on there. There was a little fishing community there. It never had a name. It had a, a beer joint on one side and uh, a few houses on there with it. And uh, folks that make their shacks out of tar paper, just whatever they could scrounge on the beach for water. They would dig a hole in the sand, get a barrel, cut out both ends of the barrel, use it, a, a bucket to dip it out. And kids lived there and, and were brought up there. And it's, it's so different today where that property would cost millions of dollars. But 80 years ago, you just came in there and lived there for free. With Across that pass, they had a hand drawn ferry. This is not a picture of that hand drawn ferry. It's just the one I picked up off the internet. But to get across, they'd have a couple of two by twelves, have it on the bank there, they had a rope, pull a rope across, drive the car up there. I have a cousin that uh, remembers that, said, oh that was the scariest thing. He's driving up on those two just kind of rope boards there, and the guy drawing the ferry, he might have been drinking beer at the little store or whatever like that, so you, you don't know about the quality of, of getting across. And then sometimes when the water was low enough, people would drive in the gulf in low tides, and they just kind of save the dollars, drive through the surf and get through the air. The, the next set of passes, I call it burning diesel. That's when you get a piece of equipment, you go drive around there, you really don't accomplish anything except burning a bunch of diesel. We saw that with the dredge boats, they burn coal, they burn wood. Well, we started burning diesel at Yarborough's Pass. Yarborough's Pass is, is at the head end of this bay system on there. The uh, Texas Fish Game and Oyster wanted, uh, they were concerned about the salinity in Baffin Bay on there, and they wanted more circulation with it. So they started dig digging, they bought a dredge, bought, and they just dug it in December 1940, lasted five months, November 1942, lasted about three months, right in May 1944, November 1944, February 19, or 1952. They finally, after all that time, figured that uh, it really wasn't worth it in the past, like all the other passes that just fill in. Uh, I've got a little bit backwards, but this is our fish pass. Dr. Barron's here can tell you a lot more than I can about it. It was a water exchange pass. It was actually built in 1972. With it, uh, several million dollars of state money, the same thing. We want to increase the circulation going into the bay. With it, uh, you can see it showing up here, so it's seven years old. 
This was 1985. You can see it was completely plugged in, in 1985. Well, I, I've got my page wrong. This is uh, 2014, so it's well grassed over and, and things with it. So uh, that path lasted about seven years, cost about $4 million. The Jennings make a spot, but uh, not much more with it. Great hmm? surface. Great surface spot too. And then 2005, the pack, what we call the Packer Channel today, was put in there. We go over the Packer Bridge. That cost about $10 million with it. It was, uh, at least they had money for dredging. So they uh, dredged it in 2012 with it. It went seven years without dredging. And the last survey said we've got about three or four more years. It cost $2.4 so we'll be dredging again in the uh, in a while. And then the last thing, this is Cedar Bayou. I, I'm really, that's not an area of my expertise at all. I thought it was interesting. This picture was taken just after uh, it, it was completed. This is Vincent Slew coming through here. Mark Brayton has a great picture of it. This is uh, the channel kind of changed and it's already plugged going into here. The, the, by you itself, it is still working. But it's, it's just one more instance we think we can dig. They had numerous experts went and said, we got, we got it down now. We'll go ahead and dig this thing. We promise it'll stay. It, it, it will stay for a while. Uh, when we have a lot of water circulation we have now, it keeps those passes open. But we get a good wind going, uh, like we saw on, on the 28th in the right conditions and then that passes. And we can start saving our money and soon spend several million dollars more. <laughs> but you know, we as a society, we kind of forget our history sometimes. Uh, when our wallets get ahead of ourselves, we have this great vision. We don't listen to our experts out here and, and do things. So. Uh, that's it. So. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.
was the hardest on the target. But I saw, I still have a number of postcards of fairly good size and fairly good numbers of tarpon in the 50s, in the early 50s. Yeah. And I'm, you know, somebody told me that they think that fresh water going through that pass did away with the Manhattan, and that was what the tarpon were eating, and they, they attributed it to the dredging. The, the fresh water is fairly inconsequential. That uh, it's basically salt water that, that's going through there. So I, I don't think a, a lot, there was a lot of difference in salinity. But for y'all that don't know Port of Rangers, it was originally, or one of its names at one point in time was Tarpon, Texas. They were a great sport fish in the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. You had fishermen from all over the world. The Brits loved to come down here. And it, this was one of the top three areas of, of tarpon fishing in the world. And, and some of them said it was the number one area. No, I don't. They're, they're going to add hard shelf on there, probably doubling the width on the bay portion. They're limited by the jets with it, so there's not much that they can do there. Authorized depth, I mean, maybe just another five feet more. Well, I think it's 55. Yeah. Well, they, they dig it to 48. They, they, over, they over, yes, authorized to 45, it goes down to 48. 400 feet wide. It's 400 feet wide. And the, the jetties were completed in 1919. So we're using these big channels and everything else for an engineering structure. I was telling you what we did wrong, but here's what we did right. That jetty system, the completion of it is almost 100 years old. So the, the same length, the same locks, just about the same everything in those jetties. That last stone, except for the little bit of maintenance, was done in 1919. It started in the 1880s. Oh, Jerry, what was it? The Jerry, what was it? It was finished finally in 1919. Yeah, but it st started in 1890. Well, yeah. I want to go back to the original origin this time. And the Aransas Pass here, our channel here, <laughs> yeah, the, the Corpus Christi Pass was static. Where it was, uh, it didn't change much up until the 1916 storm. But the Aransas Pass was moving over 200 feet a year until they put rocks along the Port Aransas shoreline. And we all look at that beautiful lighthouse out there in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> when they built that lighthouse in 1852, that's where the channel came in. And there was a big argument up in Washington. One group said we need a light ship there because the inlet, the channel is not stable. But the brick guys went over and said, no, no, we need a fixed lighthouse. We've got a fixed lighthouse. It's a great place to live. It's a great place to live. Two of our tenders here. For Any more questions?